When Darla Harper didn't show up for work, her boss knew something had gone wrong. The 25-year-old had always been exceptionally punctual and exceedingly reliable. She never missed a day without calling, and she rarely missed a day at all. When multiple calls to Darla's apartment went unanswered, her boss decided to take the 20-minute drive out of Little Rock to check in on her. Receiving no answer at Darla's door, a neighbor called police, but no one could have imagined what they would discover. Inside the apartment, officers found Darla's two-year-old daughter all by herself, but there was no trace of her mother. The investigation would quickly uncover a series of bizarre clues, a spot of blood on the apartment door, an unfinished letter lying on the bed, and reports of strange sounds coming from the apartment the night before. The missing woman's car had been left abandoned at a commuter lot several miles away, The wheels were caked in mud, twigs and branches were stuck to the rear bumper, and there was blood, inside and out. A series of searches were executed covering hundreds of square miles of busy city streets, densely wooded lots, sprawling fields, and even the Arkansas River, but not a single trace could be found. What happened to Darla Harper? Had she been abducted during the night by a stranger who came knocking at her door, Or had the single mother specifically been targeted, perhaps by someone she knew, who believed they had something to gain from her absence? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 175, The Disappearance of Darla Harper, Part 1. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine a truly mysterious disappearance nearly as devoid of clues as it is rife with controversy. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Before getting into today's episode, I wanted to take a moment to address an update on a case previously featured on Trace Evidence. An arrest has been made in the 2012 unsolved murder of UNC Chapel Hill student Faith Hedgepeth, profiled in episode 23. Last week, Chapel Hill police announced the arrest of 28-year-old Miguel Enrique Salguero Oliveras. According to investigators, the arrest warrant was issued after Oliveras' DNA matched samples recovered from the scene of Faith's murder. As of this time, police are not revealing very much information about the arrest, the suspect, or how Oliveras fits into their previous investigation. As soon as more information becomes available, I'll release a more formal update episode. Nine years have passed since Faith was murdered, and now, we hope, justice is imminent. On a seemingly normal Tuesday night, Darla Harper was home alone with her young daughter. By sunrise the next day, the 25-year-old mother had mysteriously vanished. Faced with a severe lack of clues and evidence, investigators would confront a case where almost anything was possible. This is Episode 175, The Disappearance of Darla Harper, Part 1. In a quiet little apartment complex north of Little Rock, there was a hushed stillness in the air. The clanging ring of a telephone would dimly resound behind the door to apartment number eight, but no one would answer. Hours later, after the parking lot had mostly emptied, as tenants had left to go to work, run errands, or attend school, the phone in apartment eight continued to ring. Kathy Jumper could hear the sound bouncing off the wall she shared with her neighbor, but thought nothing of it whoever gives much thought to their neighbor's telephone. Not long after this last series of rings, a car slowly pulled into the parking lot and came to a stop just outside of door number eight. 
A young woman stepped out of the car and walked towards the door with a seemingly quickened pace. For several minutes, she rang the bell and banged her fists against the wood, but there was no response. Just then, Kathy popped her head out the door to find out what was going on. The woman was looking for her neighbor, Darla. She hadn't shown up to work, wasn't answering her phone, and no one knew where she was. As the two women discussed the possibility that Darla may have had car trouble somewhere along the way, they suddenly heard something from behind the door. A soft, high-pitched voice cried out from within the apartment. Kathy immediately recognized the voice of Darla's two-year-old daughter. She ran back to her apartment and quickly dialed 911. Deputies from the sheriff's office arrived at the complex and, wielding a key from the landlord, asked the two women to stand aside as they entered the apartment. Inside, they found an eerie scene. The two-year-old child was alone in the apartment and there was no sign of her mother. Darla's bed was still made. Her shoes sat on the floor beside it. Picking up the little girl, one of the deputies turned back towards the entryway, and that's when he saw it. A thin splotch of partially dried blood smeared across the wooden surface. Holding the little girl close, the deputy softly asked if she knew where her mother was. The girl's reply sent a chill racing down his spine. Mommy's in a bag. Darla Melissa Nixon was born on Saturday, July 2nd, 1960 in Pine Bluff, Arkansas to parents Jerry and Mel. Located 50 miles southeast of the state capital of Little Rock, Pine Bluff is the 10th largest city in Arkansas and is the county seat of Jefferson. Darla was the Nixon's third and last child, giving her an older brother, Jerry Don Jr., and a sister, Deborah. Growing up in a tight-knit family unit, Darlet has been described as being caring, independent, and a fun-loving person who loved to laugh and could find the humor in almost any situation. Intelligent and driven, Darla performed well throughout her early school years. In the mid-1970s, she began attending Pine Bluff High School, where she continued to achieve high marks. Darla was a member of the Cooperative Office Education Program, which focused on teaching students to engage and direct business enterprises. Her father, Jerry, was an entrepreneur himself, who previously founded both the Pine Bluff Abstract Company and the Arkansas Title Insurance Company in 1965 and 1968, respectively. Darla would work for her father over the years when school allowed, giving her a taste of business life and a little money in her pocket. Graduating high school in 78, Darla moved on to the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, where she continued to maintain high grades, earning praise from several professors for her exemplary work. During her time in Little Rock, Darla picked up work at the American Abstract and Title Company, having earned a lot of experience working with her father. A year later, before her 19th birthday, Darla would marry 22-year-old Barry Wayne Harper at the Green Meadows Baptist Church. Born in Star City, just a 20-minute drive south of Pine Bluff, Barry was, at the time, employed by the Southwestern Bell Telephone Company. Marrying in the summer of 79, Darla and Barry set off for a honeymoon in Florida before returning to live in Arkansas. A year later, in November of 1980, Darla would pass the board exam to become a licensed abstractor. An abstractor works to certify the history of a piece of real estate, creating property packages that discuss deeds, zoning regulations, and everything a particular party might need to know before purchasing or altering a property. In 1981, Darla and Barry would move to a home on Hillwood Drive in Sherwood, Arkansas, 60 miles north of Pine Bluff and just outside the city limits of Little Rock. Around this time, Darla changed careers, being hired on to work for the Internal Revenue Service as a personnel analyst. Now 21, she seemed to appreciate the challenges of her new job, though she, as always, quickly developed a reputation for her hard work and reliability. For Darla herself, it was a nice change of pace, and she certainly wasn't going to complain about the short eight-mile drive from her home to the federal building just across the Arkansas River. In late 1982, Darla's priorities found themselves rearranged when she became pregnant. 
Beaming and excited to become a mother, Darla became focused on making plans to ensure her child would have the best life possible. Unfortunately, it was also around this time that the strong foundation she and Barry had built began to show hints of fracture. Barry had begun to drink more heavily, and both his mood and demeanor were shifting. Arguments between the couple occurred more frequently, and while Darla wanted to keep the marriage together to provide a solid family for their coming child, she could tell that the damage might already be too far along to repair. In the summer of 1983, Darla gave birth to a beautiful baby girl who would be named Leslie. To say her daughter became the central focus of her universe would be an understatement, as everyone who knew the young mother remarked upon how much she loved her daughter and wanted to give her the world. Sadly, Darla quickly came to discover that if she wanted to provide Leslie with the loving and nurturing home environment she dreamed of, she wouldn't be able to do that alongside Barry. Things were getting progressively worse with Barry's drinking, taking a backseat to his indulgence in drugs, specifically cocaine. Darla was watching as the man she married was slowly overcome by addiction. A man who had once been business savvy, forward thinking, and hard working was transforming into an angry, violent addict. Despite several attempts to set things straight and work through the issues, Darla finally accepted the truth of her reality. Just a year and three months after the birth of their daughter, the 24 year old filed for divorce. In her divorce complaint, Darla stated that Barry was drinking far too much and, as a result, had become both physically and verbally abusive. They had been married for just five years at the time. Things were difficult over the course of the next year, with Darla trying both to create a warm and loving home for her daughter, away from Barry, while also struggling emotionally about the divorce. According to friends and family, Darla still loved Barry, but she also knew that things weren't going to get better. Despite this, she did decide to give him another chance the next year, when the two reconciled in the early part of 1985. For a time, things were good, but Darla began seeing familiar red flags. Barry started drinking again, then drinking more. He dabbled in drugs, became angry and violent, and finally in the summer of 85, Darla left for good. In August of that year, the court awarded her temporary custody of Leslie. While not mentioned in court documents, it would later be revealed that in addition to his abusive behavior, Barry had been carrying on an affair with another woman. Darla moved out of their shared Hillwood Drive home and ultimately rented a place at the Seven Oaks Apartments in Gravel Ridge, just four miles northwest of the home she had shared with Barry. Today, Gravel Ridge is officially part of Sherwood, having been annexed in 2008, but at the time it was merely noted as being a census-designated place on the edge of both Sherwood and Jacksonville. Darla's mother, Mel, would later tell the Arkansas Democrat that her daughter had specifically chosen a location close to her former home because she liked and trusted her babysitter, and if she moved too far away, she'd need to find a replacement. At Seven Oaks, Darla moved into apartment number eight with her daughter. There, she would make friends with several of her neighbors, including 26-year-old Kathy Jumper. The two would quickly find themselves spending a lot of time chatting and hanging out, with Kathy stopping by to visit several times a week. Though the circumstances weren't necessarily what she had wanted, Darla was making the best of it, though it wasn't always easy. She was now balancing the complexities of working a full-time job, raising her daughter, and negotiating the terms of her divorce through her lawyer, C. Mac Norton. Despite the difficulties and abuse Darla had suffered during the latter half of the marriage, the details of the settlement were actually moving forward with general ease. It wasn't what one might call a contentious divorce by any means, at least not outwardly. Darla and Barry were able to agree about almost everything related to property and money. Under the agreement, which had been drawn up, the couple would split $58,000 from the sale of stock and securities, and Barry agreed to pay $224 a month in child support. On November 6, 1985, 13 months after initially filing for divorce, both couples went before a judge where the terms of the settlement were discussed. At the time, the court felt the terms were acceptable and that the divorce could be granted. 
However, no decree was signed that day because there were still a few details which needed to be ironed out regarding some shared property. The next hearing was scheduled to take place in April of 1986, but Darla would mysteriously disappear before she ever got a chance to stand before the judge. Sometime in late 1985, or perhaps early 1986, Barry checked himself into a substance abuse facility in Little Rock. During the time that he was receiving treatment, Darla visited him to check in and see how he was doing, and of course, to allow him to spend a little time with their two-year-old daughter. While details regarding these visits have never been publicly shared, it was later confirmed that in the months leading up to her disappearance, Darla became acquainted with another man at the rehab facility, and eventually, the two began dating. This man's name has never been revealed by investigators or Darla's family. Darla's relationship with the man began quickly and was going well, according to friends and family. However, within the first few months of the year, something began to change, and Darla started to wonder if perhaps she had made a mistake. Her divorce wasn't yet finalized. She needed to focus on her career and her daughter, and it wasn't the best time to try and forge a new relationship. At the time, Darla's boyfriend lived approximately an hour away from her apartment, and as she began internally debating her choices, she started to grow distant. She called him less and spent more time on her own, but he wasn't interested in ending things. Speaking to the Arkansas Democrat, Mel later explained, quote, Letters found in her apartment indicated she was in love with the man and that later she realized she was making a mistake and was trying to end the relationship. He was calling, demanding to know where she was if she wasn't answering the phone. She told her friend she wanted to break up, but was afraid he would go back to drugs. End quote. While trying to figure out a way to end the relationship without hurting the man, or worse yet, sending him spiraling into a dark place where he might seek out drugs again, a heartbreaking tragedy would strike Darla and her family. On Friday, February 21st, Darla's older sister Deborah passed away at the age of 27. Deborah, who was employed by the Bluff Jefferson Abstract and Title Corporation, died of a tragic accident, with newspapers reporting that she had choked to death. The Nixon family was absolutely devastated by this news, and Darla took it hard. She and her sister had always been close. The age gap between them was less than two years. The funeral took place on Monday, February 24th, and the 27-year-old was laid to rest in Cypress Memorial Gardens. Dealt such a heavy blow, the Nixon family drew closer together and relied upon each other to make it through their grief and pain. Horrifyingly, just eight days after laying Deborah to rest, Darla would mysteriously vanish. Six days after the funeral on Sunday, March 2nd, Darla and her daughter visited with her parents and went to church. While the wounds from Deborah's death were still raw, together the family had begun the difficult steps of trying to heal and were supported by a tight-knit group of friends. During that Sunday visit, everything seemed to be normal, as normal as it could be for Darla, and no one had any impression that something was wrong. As the evening drew on, Darla announced she was going to be heading home for the evening to make the rounds, saying goodbye to her parents and friends. Sometime later, however, Darla was back. Mel later explained this moment to KARK News, saying, quote, I thought she had left for the evening. I had some friends over and looked up, and there was Darla. I got the feeling she had come back to talk to me, but we had company. We never did have another conversation. I always had the feeling there was a purpose, that she had come back for a purpose. That's something that haunts me now. End quote. Monday, March 3rd seems to have gone on as a normal day. Darla waited for the babysitter, then headed off to work in Little Rock, and then came back home that evening to spend the night with her daughter. At some point, Mel picked up the phone and called to check in on her, and the two had a short conversation. At no point during this conversation did Mel worry or feel concern, nor did she feel that Darla had something on her mind that she needed to share. Sadly, neither woman would ever have imagined that this would be the last conversation they'd ever have. According to Anne Blaylock, one of Darla's co-workers, 
The 25-year-old mother called in sick on Tuesday, March 4th. No details have been given out about her call-out, so whether Darla was actually sick, just needed a day off, or something had come up that she needed to do, we simply don't know. The last confirmed sighting of Darla was made by her neighbor and friend, Kathy Jumper. According to Kathy, she went over to visit Darla in her apartment in the early evening hours and stayed until approximately 9.30. At the time she left, Kathy stated that Darla seemed normal and there was no indication that anything was wrong. Two hours later, around 11.30 p.m., Kathy heard several noises coming from Darla's apartment. Kathy would later describe the noise as sounding like furniture was being roughly or forcefully moved inside of her neighbor's apartment. Curious, Kathy picked up her phone and called Darla, but hung up after several rings went unanswered. Kathy would later explain that the sounds didn't make her think something bad had happened to Darla, and they didn't last for a long period of time. When her call went unanswered, she ultimately decided to hang up because she didn't want to wake up the two-and-a-half-year-old Leslie. Kathy would not be the only call to go unanswered. At 5.30 a.m. on Wednesday, March 5th, the babysitter called the apartment. This was, presumably, to find out what the plan was for the day. Since Darla had called in sick on Tuesday, the babysitter was calling to find out if she was staying home again that day or if she would need to look after Leslie. The 5.30 call went unanswered, so the babysitter waited 15 minutes, calling back at 5.45, but this call went unanswered as well. At 6 a.m., she called for the third and final time, and once again, the phone just kept ringing. Assuming that Darla wasn't feeling well or was still sleeping, the babysitter hung up figuring that Darla would call her back, but she never did. Down at the Federal Building in Little Rock, Co-workers began noticing that Darla hadn't arrived for her shift. This was very unlike the 25-year-old single mother who always called out if she wasn't going to make it in. When her boss was notified, he placed several calls to her apartment but, like everyone else, received no answer. Knowing that Darla had called out sick the day before, her boss was concerned that perhaps her illness was worse than she'd thought and she may be in need of assistance. When no one could get in touch with Darla by that afternoon, the decision was made to send someone by to check on her. A co-worker arrived at the Seven Oaks Apartments at approximately 1.15 p.m. Knocking on the door, she could hear sounds from inside, but there was no answer from Darla. Back in her neighboring apartment, Kathy Jumper heard the commotion and came outside to find out what was going on. Once the co-worker explained the situation, Kathy came to the door and began knocking as well. While she did not hear Darla, Kathy quickly recognized Leslie as the child was making sounds and crying out in response to the knocking. In that moment, a chill shivered down Kathy's spine. Because if Leslie was inside, Darla had to be there. And if she wasn't answering, then something had to be very wrong. Unable to gain entry, Kathy returned to her apartment and quickly called 911. At 2.15 p.m., deputies from the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office arrived on the scene. After speaking to Kathy and Darla's co-worker, authorities contacted the apartment manager. Arriving with the key in hand, the manager unlocked the door to apartment number 8 and was asked to wait outside while the deputies entered. Once inside, police didn't see anything that seemed to be out of place. There was no sign of a struggle and nothing to suggest anything was wrong, except for Leslie. Deputies found the child in the apartment by herself, and there was no sign of Darla anywhere. According to investigators, at the time they found the child, she didn't appear to be scared or harmed in any way, just mostly confused. At that time, the deputies picked Leslie up and decided to remove her from the apartment while they tried to determine what exactly was happening. Making their way back towards the parking lot, the deputies quickly discovered what appeared to be a small amount of blood on Darla's apartment door. They closed off the apartment to protect the scene and contacted dispatch. The deputies requested that someone get in contact with Darla's parents to make them aware of the situation. They also reported what they had seen in the apartment, requesting investigators to come down as they had an apparent missing person situation on their hands. Jerry and Mel Nixon then received the call no parent wants. Just eight days after struggling through the funeral of their oldest daughter,
they now had to face the brutal reality that their other daughter was now missing. Deputies explained to the Nixons that they'd entered the apartment and found Leslie by herself. Hearing those words, all of the blood drained from Mel's face as an overwhelming feeling of dread rose up in the back of her mind. Speaking to THV 11 CBS News, Mel explained, quote, When I heard that, I just was devastated because I knew that there was no way short of somebody taking her away that she would have left Leslie alone. So I knew something was really terribly wrong. End quote. Jerry and Mel began making their way north to Darla's apartment. They needed to see it for themselves, and they'd agreed to take Leslie into their custody. By the time they arrived, there were multiple sheriff's units on the scene, and investigators were examining the apartment and interviewing neighbors. According to the sheriff's office, the apartment was orderly and showed no signs of a struggle. The only clue discovered that suggested a crime may have occurred was what investigators have described as a small smear of blood on the apartment door. At the time, a sample of the blood was taken and sent to the state crime lab for analysis. Investigators hoped that technicians would be able to type the blood for them so they could try and determine whether it belonged to Darla or perhaps someone else. On Darla's bed, Police found a half-finished thank-you note that she had apparently been writing to someone who had sent flowers to her sister's funeral. Her shoes were on the floor beside the bed. For the most part, Darla's neighbors hadn't heard or seen anything between 9.30 when she was last seen and when police arrived that afternoon. While Kathy hadn't directly witnessed anything, she did report the sound she'd heard the night before, as well as details regarding a phone call. According to Kathy, when she was visiting with Darla the night she vanished, she got a call from a man she'd been dating. Darla apparently answered the call and told the man she had company and would call him back. After hanging up, Kathy stated that Darla turned to her and rhetorically asked, How do you get rid of a guy like that? Investigators added the man to the list of people they needed to speak with. Turning their attention to the parking lot, there was no sign of Darla's car. It wasn't parked in her assigned spot, and according to Kathy, she had seen the vehicle there at 9.30 p.m. the night before. Authorities notified all units to be on the lookout for the car, described as a 1981 Honda Accord. Speaking to Darla's parents, investigators were told that they had seen no signs that anything was wrong, nor had their daughter complained or voiced any concerns to them about fearing for her safety. Asked if there was anything in Darla's life that may have been causing her a lot of stress, Jerry and Mel explained that her older sister had passed away 10 days prior. Initially, police began to consider that Darla could have left of her own volition, perhaps in a state of depression and dismay. But friends and family were quick to shoot that theory down, noting that Darla would never, under any circumstances, leave Leslie alone in the apartment. With little to go on, investigators hoped to conduct more interviews to try and determine what exactly may have happened. Outside of immediate family, the next person they wanted to speak with was Darla's estranged husband, Barry. At the time, Barry told police that he had last seen Darla on Sunday, March 2nd, though he noted that as they were separated and nearing the completion of their divorce, they were not seeing each other or speaking regularly. Asked about where he was the night Darla vanished, Barry told investigators he was driving around with a friend and arrived home at approximately 11 p.m. Checking into his story, police spoke with some of his neighbors, though none of them had noticed whether his car was in the driveway or not the night before. The only person who had actually seen Barry's car at his house had seen it at approximately 4 a.m. as he was leaving for work. Asked about his soon-to-be ex-wife's disappearance, Barry later told the Arkansas Democrat, quote, It's a shock. It's hard to understand what's happened there because it's not like her to just leave. End quote. Investigators also managed to get in touch with Darla's boyfriend, who claimed he had no knowledge of anyone who would be looking to harm her, nor had he seen anything to suggest she was in any danger. According to police, the man was able to provide them with an alibi for his whereabouts the night of the disappearance, and he was extremely cooperative with their investigation, agreeing to take a polygraph test. At the time, it was noted that when asked the same question, Barry had no interest in submitting to a polygraph examination. 
Based on the information available at the time, investigators determined that Leslie had been left alone in the apartment for approximately 14 hours, placing the time of Darla's disappearance sometime between 11.30 p.m. and midnight, right around the time Kathy heard noises coming from the apartment. While they didn't possess hard evidence that a crime had been committed, the decision was made to approach the investigation as though Darla had been the victim of an abduction. Her description and the details of her last known sighting were given to the local media, who issued television and newspaper alerts about the missing mother. Unfortunately, little was learned during the first day of the investigation, but the second day would bring their first break. At approximately 5 p.m. on Thursday, March 6th, Darla's 1981 Honda Accord was located. Sergeant Carl Beadle, the lead investigator on the case, informed the media that the vehicle had been found parked in a commuter lot approximately 10 miles to the southwest of the apartment, just off Interstate 40 at Crystal Hill Road. Major Larry Dill, chief of the Criminal Investigation Division, told the Arkansas Gazette that, according to their investigation, Darla never parked her car in this lot, and they believed it had been left there by someone involved in her disappearance. Upon discovering the car, police noted that there were small spots of blood on both the hatchback and the driver's side door handle. There was mud all over the tires and halfway up the body of the car, and there were twigs and pieces of branches jutting out from the rear bumper. Inside the vehicle, police recovered a short length of rope, and additional blood spots were found in the rear, behind the back seat. However, when a forensic examination of the car was completed, it was determined that whoever had been driving the car had taken the trouble to wipe down almost the entire vehicle, inside and out. The suspect, though, had missed two spots, as police managed to obtain three fingerprints, two from the rearview mirror and one from the passenger side door. Samples of the blood were sent out to the state crime lab for examination while police began canvassing the area around the commuter lot. Being that different people parked there daily, no one really paid too much attention to who was driving what car. While they weren't able to get anyone who had seen the car being left, they did find a witness who could give them a time frame. The commuter lot is adjacent to a gas station, and an attendant working the overnight shift had noticed the vehicle's appearance. While he didn't see it arrive, he was able to tell police that the car was not present in the lot at 9 p.m., but was there at midnight. The drive from Darla's apartment to the lot takes approximately 20 minutes, meaning that if she had been abducted at approximately 11.30, the suspect had to move quickly, getting Darla out of the apartment and on the road in less than 10 minutes to make it to the lot by midnight. Considering the mud and shrubbery on the car, Authorities began organizing a large-scale search of wooded areas surrounding the lot. The Sheriff's Office called in assistance from the National Guard and Air Force, who sent two helicopters out to search from the sky. Local news station KARK-TV took Sheriff Carol Gravette and Chief Deputy Jim Vinson up in their traffic helicopter to aid in the search as well. While the traffic helicopter focused in on the area immediately surrounding the parking lot, the National Guard searched the Camp Robbins area, five miles to the northeast, while the Air Force focused on wooded areas and fields north of the lot. The air and foot searches continued for several hours, but ultimately nothing was found. Police began planning a larger search for the next day and were joined by members of local law enforcement as well as volunteers. Thirty of Darla's IRS co-workers would take part in this search. Friday, March 7th began with search members being divided into different groups. Some were sent to search around the apartment complex and wooded areas near it, while others focused on the area of the commuter lot and rural areas to the north. Three helicopters were again utilized while mounted police took to the more challenging terrain. Detective Ray McGee, when asked about the search, bluntly told the Arkansas Gazette, quote, we're hunting a proverbial needle in a haystack. We're following up any leads. We're looking in dirt cul-de-sacs, dead-end areas, and remote areas where a car might have driven up and a body could have been thrown out. End quote. Anne Blaylock told reporters that she had been instructed by the IRS's Criminal Investigation Division 
to search for Darla on narrow roads with water and surrounded by cedar trees because Darla's car appeared to have been driven through a rural area, possibly on a dirt road through the woods. This same day, police announced they'd received results of the tests conducted on the blood found on Darla's apartment door. Unfortunately, the lab was only able to determine that the blood belonged to a human being, but the sample was too small to get a blood type. Over the course of the next three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, searches were conducted from sunrise to sunset, covering all of the Crystal Hill area as well as Camp Robbins. The search expanded to include large areas of northern Pulaski County and the Arkansas River. Deputies and volunteers searched along both sides of the river, while other investigators searched from the river itself aboard a flat-bottom boat. By sunset on Sunday, March 9th, Darla had been missing for five days, and other than her car, not a single trace of the 25-year-old mother was found. Hoping for assistance covering large swaths of land, Sheriff Gravett issued a statement to the media on Monday, March 10th, requesting that all landowners in northern Pulaski County search their fields, barns, and any structures on their property for signs of Darla. Asked about progress on the search, Pulaski Sheriff's Office Communication Officer Sherry Rainey told the Gazette, quote, We still don't know where she might be. We're still concentrating on the area near where her car was found because that's the only lead we have. But she could be anywhere. End quote. On Tuesday, March 11th, Darla's parents put up a reward of $25,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of whoever was responsible for their daughter's disappearance. By this point, her family strongly believed that the likelihood of finding her alive was slim, with her father Jerry telling the Democrat, quote, I think we have to accept that her death is a very real possibility at this time. We're not giving up hope, though. At this time, as hard as it is to accept, the odds are she's dead. End quote. During the second week, investigators continued searches of areas around where Darla lived and where her car had been found, but as before, they weren't able to turn up any clues or new leads. In desperation, Darla's family turned to the first of several psychics, hoping that some answer might be provided. Carol Pate, famous in Arkansas for her work with investigators in the past, was brought in and authorities allowed her to examine Darla's car. While police weren't the ones who had called Pate in, they acknowledged that the family was free to do so if they desired, and if anything relevant to the case came out of it, they would track the lead down. On Saturday, March 15th, A massive search for Darla was organized by the Pulaski Sheriff's Office and the Criminal Investigation Division of the IRS. A large group of federal employees were headed up by Lemoyne Bass, who worked for the Federal Health and Human Services Department. Approximately 50 people volunteered for the search and were joined by firefighters from both Sherwood and Oak Grove. The fire departments provided communications equipment to keep the search parties in contact with one another and also provided detailed information and maps of the area. The search focused on a three-square-mile area in both Crystal Hill and Oak Grove. Approximately 125 people were involved in the search, some of who were riding all-terrain vehicles through the more difficult terrain. After eight hours, though, nothing related to Darla's disappearance was found. Searchers told the media that they would continue searching, with their next target being Camp Robinson. This area would provide a massive challenge for searchers as it encompassed over 32,000 acres of land, and even with the large number of volunteers they had, they couldn't possibly cover it all in a day, let alone several days. Unfortunately, as time passed and further searches were conducted, The absence of any evidence or clues led many to believe that, wherever Darla was, it wasn't in the areas they were looking. In mid-April, more than a month after Darla's disappearance, the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office officially ended their searches for the missing mother, telling the press that while the search was over, the investigation was only just beginning. The month of April also brought on a hearing before Judge Bruce Bullion regarding the finalization of the divorce decree, 
but Judge Bullion threw everyone a curveball. On Thursday, April 24th, Bullion refused to sign off on the divorce decree because, at the time, it was unknown whether Darla was alive or dead. Instead, Bullion said the divorce decree would wait, and in the meantime, Leslie would be placed under the custody of her father, and therefore, child support payments were abated. This came as a surprise to lawyers on both sides as the agreement had been approved by Barry and Darla prior to her disappearance. Darla's lawyer, C. Mac Norton, spoke to the media about his intent to file an appeal, explaining that under the divorce, land and money had been divided and mutually agreed upon. However, if the divorce was not approved, then Barry would technically still be Darla's husband and therefore positioned to inherit all of her share. For the next five months, detectives struggled to get a foothold in the case, finding themselves running into dead ends constantly. The sheriff's office stated several times that they were working on multiple leads, though they never shared any of the details. In early September, Darla's family made an adjustment to the reward they were offering. Rather than $25,000 for an arrest and conviction, they now offered $10,000 for information leading to the recovery of Darla, dead or alive, and $16,000 for an arrest and conviction. Mel Nixon spoke with the Gazette explaining, quote, We don't have any hopes that she is alive because she was a mother first and loved her family. There's no way I can believe that she's out there alive and has the ability to contact us. If we could only bring her back and bury her next to our other daughter, it wouldn't make it any easier, but it would be easier to go to bed with. It's the sort of thing you go to bed and wake up in the morning with on your mind. It's constantly on your mind. End quote. While the reward offer did result in a lot of new tips coming in, the vast majority led nowhere. Police were at a loss. How does a woman just vanish in the middle of the night and no one sees anything? Around this time, detectives received a call from someone they had previously interviewed during canvassing. A woman who lived in Darla's apartment complex contacted authorities and claimed to have witnessed the abduction. When asked why she had waited five months to contact police, the woman said that she was in fear for her safety. According to this witness, on the night of Darla's abduction, she saw three men at the door of the apartment. While she couldn't tell what they were doing, she thought maybe they were trying to jimmy the door open. The woman couldn't remember a lot of details, though, telling police that she was so afraid it was as if her memory had been blocked. In hopes of unlocking the secrets of what the witness had seen, police arranged for her to meet with a psychiatrist who would place her under hypnosis. During the session, the woman described looking out her window, where she could see into Darla's apartment. The woman said a large man with a scar on his face viciously beat Darla while two other men in the apartment watched on. The witness claimed that the men had wanted to force Darla into participating in a pornographic film, and when she refused, they began assaulting her. She then explained that, after assaulting Darla, the men wrapped her in a blanket and took her out of the apartment, putting her in the back of her own car. The witness would also state that she herself had been sexually assaulted by the three men who had threatened to kill her children if she told her husband or police. The witness was able to identify the three men as painters who had been completing a job at the apartment complex the week Darla disappeared. Sergeant Beadle later told the Democrat that this witness had managed to describe evidence of the crime which at that time was known only to investigators. Armed with this new information, police began trying to locate the men and during the investigation, discovered that one of them had a brother who had previously been arrested for distributing pornography. While they didn't have corroborating evidence to support the witness's statement given under hypnosis, this seemed to fit with the account she had given. Ultimately, all three men were tracked down and brought in for questioning. Despite interviews lasting several hours, investigators could never find anything to tie the men to the crime. None of their fingerprints matched those recovered from the car, and they had alibis for their whereabouts the night Darla vanished. This was one of the strongest leads they'd had during the investigation, and it was just another dead end. According to the sheriff's office, 
The witness later changed her story several times before ultimately recanting the entire account. She was later arrested in a different state for making a false police report and was placed under psychiatric care. While the woman's story could no longer be relied upon, it was interesting to investigators that one piece of her statement actually matched a different witness's account. While police didn't share this publicly at the time, they had interviewed Darla's daughter in the days following her mother's disappearance. She was only two and a half years old in 1986, so police weren't expecting to get much out of her. They hoped maybe a name, a description, even any small detail about what happened that night. Leslie would make three separate comments which suggested that she had witnessed what happened to her mother that night. The child told police that three men in funny hats came in. Asked what happened next, she explained, Mommy's feet were broke. In what is perhaps her most chilling statement, she said, Mommy is in a bag. Investigators at the time believed that Leslie had witnessed the attack and abduction of her mother. The theory evolving out of the child's account was that three men had entered the apartment, likely wearing ski masks. At some point, Darla was either unconscious or dead, and the men were lifting her up, making her limp feet look to the little girl as though they were broken. Then Darla was placed inside of a bag and removed from the apartment. No one else knew about this at the time, so it really was curious that the witness, who later recanted her statement, also described three men as being present. Unfortunately, police were going to have to find more to support Leslie's account, as her story wouldn't be considered reliable enough, nor would a -a two-and-a-half-year-old be able to testify in court. Following Darla's disappearance, Leslie was placed in the custody of her father. On several occasions, both police and Darla's family appealed to Barry to allow the child to undergo therapy where she might be able to recall more details, but he wouldn't allow it, saying she was too young to understand what was going on, and the more they pressed her for information, the more damage they were doing to a little girl who was already clearly traumatized by what she had seen. Without more information to support Leslie's statements, police were nearly back to square one. The year of 1986 would end three months later with no developments or new leads. On Saturday, March 7th, 1987, the Nixon family held a memorial service for Darla. More than a year had passed, and it seemed as though the investigation was completely stalled. It had been months since there was word of any new information or potential leads, and by this time, the Nixon family were growing frustrated and impatient. Asked about the investigation, Mel explained to the Gazette, quote, I don't want to be critical, but we're not happy with the way it's gone. The investigator is not to blame. He's done all he could. Maybe the sheriff hasn't given it the emphasis he should have. End quote. She went on to explain that she felt investigators should be tracking down old leads and revisiting their original evidence, but the more time passed, the more she felt that her daughter's disappearance was being moved to the back burner. Sheriff Gravette took Mel's statement personally, but felt as though they were doing everything they possibly could. Gravette responded, quote, It's one that's been burned into our minds. We can't forget it. Every time we have a meeting, we talk about it. How can we try another approach or method? Do we have a murder? We don't have a body. It's hard to prove murder or foul play without a corpse. At this time, we follow any leads we get, and most of those are dead ends. I know we've done everything possible to this point. All we need is some new points. End quote. Gravette noted that a lack of evidence in the passage of time had only made the case that much more difficult to approach. One month later, there came a new strange twist in the investigation. On Monday, April 13th, a pharmacy in the city of Sherwood received a weird call. A woman, claiming to be calling from a doctor's office, wanted to fill a prescription of Valium for Darla Harper. Finding this odd, the pharmacist called the actual doctor's office and it was confirmed that this call was a fraudulent attempt to get the medication. That evening, a woman entered the store to pick up her prescription and also requested to be given Darla's. The pharmacist told the customer that Darla's prescription wasn't ready yet and after the woman left, he contacted police. 
The woman was later identified as being Deborah Partridge of Sherwood. When investigators sat down to question her about the incident at the pharmacy, Partridge told a strange story. According to her, she received a call that Monday morning from a woman whose voice she didn't recognize. The woman claimed to be a member of Partridge's church and asked if she wouldn't mind picking up her prescription for her. The woman identified herself as Darla Harper. Partridge told police that even after she was unable to pick up the prescription, she had no way of notifying the woman, as she had no contact information from her, and following that first phone call, the woman never called again. While investigators believe someone may have simply been trying to scam the pharmacy, pulling a name from the newspaper, Darla's family thought maybe someone was trying to make it appear as though their daughter was still alive. Police never did manage to identify the unknown caller, and Partridge was not charged with any crime. In June of 1987, C. Mac Norton went before the Court of Appeals regarding the divorce, but was not pleased with the outcome. The court ruled that since Judge Boolean had not issued a ruling, instead putting the divorce on hold, there was nothing for Norton to appeal. The court stated that Boolean had left things open, pending the discovery of whether or not Darla was alive or dead, and since he didn't enter a final decree, there was no ruling to appeal. Frustrated, Norton next set his sights on the state Supreme Court. However, in September, the Supreme Court declined to consider the case, citing the appeal court's ruling. In March of 1988, two years after Darla's disappearance, the investigation was stuck in the mud. Due to newer cases, Sergeant Beadle's ability to focus primarily on Darla's case was hindered, and he told the Gazette that there were multiple scenarios that were possible, though they had no evidence to prove any of them. Asking about his personal involvement as the lead investigator, Beadle responded, quote, A day out of every week. I'm still working on it. We get something new every now and then and follow it up. Hopefully, someday, I can figure out what in the hell happened to her. End quote. Two months later in May, Judge Bullion officially granted the divorce based on the terms which had originally been negotiated between Darla and Barry's lawyers. Norton fought hard for and was ultimately granted a retroactive ruling, which meant that all terms originally set in place in 1985 would be enacted from that day. This meant that everything Darla was set to gain in the divorce was now being held in escrow and would be made available to Leslie as soon as she reached adulthood. This included an item that investigators were not originally aware of. According to Beadle, there was a very large life insurance policy on Darla to the tune of $126,000. Barry held that policy. However, following the divorce ruling, all of that money was now to be placed into Leslie's escrow account. While police found it very suspicious that Barry had that kind of a policy on his estranged wife, it should be noted that he never contested any of Norton's legal moves. At the time, Barry continued to state that he had last seen Darla two days before her disappearance, and he had no knowledge of where she might be or what might have happened to her. In the spring of 1989, not long after the divorce was finalized, Barry married Yvonne Robbins, the woman with whom he was having an affair during his marriage to Darla. According to investigators, following his marriage, Barry essentially cut off all communication with investigators and no longer wanted to be asked about his ex-wife's disappearance. Sergeant Beadle told the Democrat that he had run into several problems during his investigation, though the primary one was that without evidence, he could not compel certain people to come in for additional questioning. He explained, quote, I wish I could get this case in front of a grand jury. If they ask you a question, you have to answer. End quote. During this interview, Beadle revealed for the first time that, back in 1986 when Darla vanished, they had conducted multiple excavations in search of her. According to Beadle, they had dug up land on a farm in Glendale, approximately 83 miles south of Darla's apartment. They had also conducted digs in several different quarries, though nothing was ever found. Following a disturbing and twisted possibility, the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office had even exhumed Darla's older sister, Deborah, considering it possible that someone had buried her in her sister's grave. 
Another long and difficult year would pass for the Nixon family. Both Jerry and Mel told reporters they wished they had the ability to quit their jobs and just work with private investigators full-time to try and find their daughter. Unfortunately, in the three years that had passed, they spent a lot of money on the investigation already. A printing company in Pine Bluff provided a free run of 11 by 14 missing persons posters, but the Nixons had paid several times to get more reprinted. They had also spent quite a deal of money employing no less than eight psychics, one of whom lived in Dallas and required the family to pay for a flight to Arkansas and back. After all of that, the best information they received was that Darla was dead, but no one knew where she was. In hopes of spreading the word about their daughter, the Nixons made a deal with a local trucking company who put up large missing persons flyers on their trucks which would make deliveries all around the region. The family even sent out flyers to neighboring states hoping someone might see Darla or hear something about the case, but this was to no avail. Mel, speaking to the Gazette, explained the grim situation, saying, quote, I'm the most frustrated person in the world. The ability to enjoy life is lost forever. End quote. Mel also spoke bluntly about the sheriff's office that she felt a thorough investigation had not been done, and she believed her daughter's case had not been given the attention it deserved. Mel insisted there were clues that were ignored, and she couldn't understand why certain lab procedures had not been conducted, namely, DNA testing on the blood recovered from the apartment and Darla's car. It was then revealed that the test conducted on the blood found in Darla's car showed that it had been left by someone who had either A or AB type blood. Both Darla and Leslie had type O. At the time, however, DNA technology was still very much in its infancy, and so there was little more they could do with the blood evidence then. In August of 1989, Barry was pulled over by a Pulaski County Sheriff's deputy who discovered a crack pipe and a fully automatic 22 caliber pistol. Barry was arrested and charged with possession of drug paraphernalia, a felony, and carrying a prohibited weapon. Called and asked for comment by the Democrat, Barry merely hung up the phone without saying a word. This arrest, however, would lead to a hearing regarding Leslie's custody. The Nixons had emergency custody of Leslie at this time, and behind lawyer C. Mac Norton, they hoped to argue that Barry should not be granted custody of their granddaughter again. What no one knew at the time was that Norton had an ace up his sleeve and he planned to wield the full power of it when he got Barry on the stand. Earlier that year, over a four-week period between January 18th and February 17th, police had been called to Barry's home four times. On January 18th, police found two children walking down Arkansas Highway 107. These children were identified as being Leslie Harper and the younger child of her new stepmother, Yvonne. When police arrived at the home, Yvonne claimed that she'd left the children in the care of her 13-year-old and she must have somehow lost track of them. Yvonne was issued a summons to appear in court for two misdemeanor charges of endangering the welfare of a minor. On February 9th, Yvonne called the police to report her 13-year-old daughter missing. When police began taking that report, Yvonne apparently explained that her daughter had been missing for three days, but they'd since found her. Unsure of why she had called to report her missing, if she'd already been found, the call was ended. Later that evening, though, police received a call from Mel Nixon. Mel alleged to have heard Yvonne screaming at Leslie over the phone, and she requested a welfare check. Police did go out to the Sherwood home, but found nothing out of the ordinary at the time. Just the next day, on February 10th, investigators arrived at the home again, this time to serve Yvonne with a contempt of court warrant. She had never appeared in court for her January misdemeanor charges. While serving the warrant, a neighbor asked to speak to police and told them that she had witnessed Yvonne trying to shove Leslie into an old abandoned truck in the backyard, and she was yelling at her that she would kill her. Since only Yvonne was home at the time, Police took her into custody and removed the children from the home. The Nixons were then granted temporary emergency custody. Barry would have visitation rights, but only under the supervision of his parents. 
One week later, on February 17th, police were called out to the home again and came upon a bizarre scene. In his report, an officer wrote that they had found Yvonne, quote, in the backyard where she had a hammer and was breaking all the windows in her husband's Ford pickup. She stated to officers that she had a gun in the house, and when her husband returned, she was going to kill him. She stated to this officer that Mr. Harper's ex-wife was buried in the backyard by an old car. End quote. Indeed, there was an old white Ford pickup in the backyard of the home, which had been there since before Darla had left Barry. In late February of 1990, court convened to hold a hearing regarding custody of Leslie, and Barry took the stand to answer questions. Multiple times, C. Mac Norton asked him questions about Darla, but Barry refused to answer, stating that these questions had nothing to do with the custody of his daughter. Asked about Yvonne's statement that Darla was buried in the backyard, Barry replied that he was unaware that his wife had said that to police and noted that she was, at the time, under a 30-day psychiatric evaluation at the state hospital. It was revealed that Yvonne suffered from bipolar disorder and may have gone off her medication. Asked if the statement from Yvonne was true, Barry replied, quote, Go dig it up if you want, end quote. Asked where he was the day Yvonne had been arrested on February 17th, his only response was, quote, hanging out here and there, end quote. On the stand, Barry admitted to having an addiction to cocaine and suffering from depression. In the previous year, he had entered rehab three separate times, though he specified that his depression was not treated or addressed during these stays. Barry also revealed that he had been fired from his job with the telephone company just weeks earlier on February 9th, due in part to his drug problem. Norton brought up Barry's August arrest when he'd been in possession of a crack pipe and automatic handgun. Ultimately, that case had gone to court and Barry had been placed on probation and paid a fine, though he had never reported to his probation officers he was required to do. As part of his probation, Barry could not be using illicit substances, But when Norton asked him the last time he'd used cocaine, he replied, yesterday or the day before. This was an under oath admission that he had violated his parole. Norton then asked Barry about a visitor he'd had while he was serving time in prison on a contempt of court charge. Barry's former work supervisor came to see and check in on him while he was in jail, and reportedly, when he asked if there was anything he could do for the man, Barry requested a gun. Norton stated, quote, he asked what he could do for you, and you said in reply, get a gun where you could take care of business, end quote. Barry replied that he didn't remember saying anything like that. Norton then pivoted to police visits to his home. On February 22nd, police received a 911 call from the house, but the caller hung up. When police arrived on the scene, an unidentified woman opened the door, and according to the report, was dressed only in an open shirt revealing her nude body underneath. This woman told police that her daughter had accidentally called 911 and it was all just a big mistake. Barry explained that a man named Greg was living at his house, sleeping on his couch, and the woman he believed was his girlfriend. When asked for Greg's last name, Barry stated he didn't know it, and Norton was incredulous that he would allow someone who didn't even know well enough to know his last name to stay in a home where his wife and child lived. Norton had masterfully gotten Barry to show that his home was not a safe environment for Leslie to be raised in and that the child should remain in the custody of the Nixons. But he wasn't done with Barry yet. Raising his voice and striding towards the witness stand, Norton looked Barry in the eyes and stated, quote, I am asking you now, under oath, is your ex-wife Darla's body buried in your backyard? End quote. Before Barry could respond, the judge paused for a moment to remind him of his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination and noted that he had already admitted to violating the conditions of his probation. The judge explained to Barry that he had a right to have a lawyer present, but Barry waived that right. After a moment's pause, he looked up at Norton and simply said, quote, Like I said, why don't you go dig the yard up? (music) 
Next week in part two of the disappearance of Darla Harper, we will discuss how the excavation of Barry's backyard ended up focusing in on the crawl space beneath his home, rumors about where he may have potentially hidden remains, a cryptic discovery beneath the house, Barry's continued arrests and incidents with the police, an alleged drive-by shooting, the Nixon family's growing frustration with the sheriff's office, a second excavation at Barry's home, the discovery of new and vital evidence, and the suspicious disappearance of Darla's cousin, plus much more. I had originally intended for this to be a one-part solo standalone episode, but I ended up finding so much information there was no way I could possibly squeeze it all into one. So I hope you'll stick with me next week to hear more about this fascinating and disturbing case. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine Anne Bertram Brittany Bivens Christine Greco Dave Allen Denise Dingsdale Diane Dyson Eamon Brady Eric Sumter Heather Louise James Jennifer Winkler Jill Sense Joni Berkwitz Kara Moreland Lars Jensen Fangel Leslie B Marla Wright Melissa Brookeisen Nick Mohar Schurz Robert Jansen Sarah Levinen, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. If you haven't already, please consider rating the show on Apple podcasts or wherever you listen. Five stars would be greatly appreciated, but it's up to you. Share these episodes, spread the word, and maybe together we can help bring justice to those who have been deprived of it. That concludes this week's episode, The Disappearance of Darla Harper, Part 1. I hope you'll join me next week for the conclusion in Part 2 on the next episode of Trace Evidence.